Let me just. Oh, good. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> let me let you know that, um, sadly enough, since um, January 6, 2020, there are a lot of resources out there for teacher education in terms of civic education. And this isn't just for social science teachers. I know that English teachers take advantage of this. I know it's, you know, it's being pushed everywhere. I mean, here are a few of my favorite online websites. They offer all this like uh, during the school year webinars, free trips in the summer go. I mean, I got to take advantage of a four day, got to go to DC, C-SPAN, you know, paid for four days of teaching how to use this for deliberation. There is so much stuff out there for teachers. It's almost overwhelming, right? So in terms of, I was talking with Carrie about like, do teachers teach this? It's hard not to. It's in our curriculum, not only in terms of skill, but in terms of content. Um, I, I mean, and there are ready-made resources all over the place, okay? So certainly, um, I mean, you look at, uh, if you are interested, uh, if you know anybody who wants to see some of this stuff, it is all accessible to me too, not just as a teacher. There's iCivics, the one by um, the Sandra Day O'Connor made is all games for the classroom and kids like think they're on little video games and they're running for office and they're fighting for their rights. And um, so I could go on and on about this, but that's not why you're here, okay? I do want to say that in terms of student interest, I've actually seen a huge, huge uptick. Um, I mean, I, I, I this is my 35th year teaching and teaching government. And I remember being at Edwana High School in the, it's for the 2000 election and students were like yawning, even though we still didn't know who was president like weeks after the election. That is not the case anymore. Kids are engaged. They're still not voting. Right, and there's only so much you can do. You can you can bring Cindy in. You can bring all these resources in and tell them they need to vote. It doesn't matter. But what we do see, and I brought these two students here for that reason, is that they are interested, they are active, and they're participating in other ways. And I think that we need to maybe think the other way around. Kids get interested. They start working at the local level. We help them get connected. But then they see where voting matters because, you know, old lady up here telling them you've got to isn't going to get them there. They're going to have to do it based on an issue that they care about. So let's help them get connected with this issue is what kind of my big message is for today, because they're hearing a lot go vote, even from peers and, you know, online and um, influencers. And, and, you know, it's it didn't happen in the 60s, even though, you know, we may have been out there protesting. It's still not happening today in this age group. I want to tell you a, 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 something I think is very exciting that's coming along that might, um, you know, really affect what, what we all do. Is that in 2020, State Board of Education adopted criteria for a state seal of civic education. This would be, will be a seal on their diploma. Um, LA County has signed into it. It is available as soon as your local school board decides what the how they're going to meet the five criteria that are being asked. Um, our school, uh, honestly, our new principal told me the other day, as soon as WASC visit is over, our accreditation visit on Wednesday, this is a top priority for us to make a plan, bring it to the board, and figure out how to do this. Yeah. Who's the new person? People might not know. Are we allowed to say? Yes. Well, I got an email that was addressed to all parents. We have. Okay, so it's We're the not current assistant here. principal, James Mitchell. I'm sorry. It's the current assistant principal oh. of curriculum, James Mitchell. It's really fair to say pending board approval. and then Pending board. Any board approval, it's James Mitchell. Okay, very good. Um, and so all the information I'm telling you in the next couple of slides come from James, because he and our department chair, Ryan Easton, spent what he said was the most fascinating three days. He learned more than he could have imagined about civic education. He said the resources are just bowling me over how much is out there. We have to figure out how we're going to turn that into something that's not heavy for kids to do, but is exciting and also works with their already current interest. Okay, um, so let me tell you what that seal of education um, is asking for. I know there's a lot of words on one slide, but there are five criteria that the students must meet, and the LEAs, which is your local education agency, so LA County plus our school board, will determine what that looks like. Okay, and just love to let you know, um, there are already six school school districts in our area that are going to be giving the seal of uh, 
of uh, civic education this year for the first time. Um, and so they already have criteria of how their students are meeting it. So we are, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just making ours more locally appropriate. First of all, be engaged in academic work in a productive way. Does that mean you have to have 2.0 in a college you know, prep, um, um, I don't know, academic program? I, I I sort of hope that because you don't want to keep anybody away from this, right? And so that's important to not be putting up blocks to this. We want every student in school to be able to access this. But the engaged part, right? Um, demonstrate competent understanding of the United States and California constitutions, et cetera, et cetera. Looks to me like this might be taking a government course, which is already required by the state of California and our district. Okay. Um, participate in one or more informed civic engagement projects that address real world problems and require students to identify and inquire into civic needs or problems, consider very responses, take action, and reflect on efforts. That is the piece that I'm hoping is jumping out to you because that's the piece where we really would love to do connections with the league. And it's the piece where man, this is the back door in to me to get students involved. Some will tell you how they already are and their natural interest, right? If they're into the environment, that's how they do it. If they're into immigration issues, um, if they're into getting funding for the arts, whatever that is. So I'll talk more about number three, demonstrate civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions through self-reflection. Sounds to me like something that, you know, you, I look at Tammy because you're always doing reflection on your portfolios. Maybe you have a portfolio of your process for three and you do a writing piece and maybe you meet with an advisor. I don't know exactly what that will look like, but you're searching in the process. And then number five, exhibit character traits that reflect civic mindedness and commitment and positivity in the classroom. <laughs> And our society. So does that like a letter of recommendation? I don't know, right? Again, this is somebody else's problem, I guess, but I think we all have some ideas. Um, so let's just talk about that. I, it should be criteria number three. So what's kind of interesting is, um, you know, we have an uh, international baccalaureate program for the juniors and seniors. But we're developing this middle years program, which is kind of an opt-in program for freshmen and sophomores at Claremont High School. That opt-in program re requires these five things, which are the exact same five things as the number three criteria. Observe a problem impacting your community. Gather information and research all sides of the problem. Come to conclusion on what can be done locally to improve the situation, take action, develop a long-term follow-up plan, and reflect. It's also a Girl Scout Gold Award. It's a Boy Scout age full project. You see, this is now, uh, it's so great. So I think we're coming together across um, so many of, uh, of, of these areas to say, this is what we ought to be having kids do. And I think this is what these two ladies did. So what does this mean? Again, CUSD will need to develop a plan. And this is an important undertaking, which will surely require student input. If you guys will be around, okay? It'll require, obviously, staff from all the schools, um, because hopefully this isn't something at, hi, now we're in high school, we're going to be doing this. This is obviously going to be built throughout, throughout our system and community input. Again, being the league and all the connections that you all have, whether it's to you know the United Nations Club or the many other things that you're involved in, um, would be I, I can't imagine a better resource than some of the people in this room. Um, so I'm going to stop there because you're you know you can hear from me all you want, but you and I can go out for coffee, but maybe not so much with these ladies who also develop their own PowerPoint here. So do you want me to just click for you while you stand yeah. there, or do you want one of these? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Hi, we're so happy to be here talking with you guys today. Um, my name is Sydney. And my name is Malia. And we're seniors from Claremont High School. Um, and we kind of wanted to talk about student involvement and social activism and what that looks like today. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so I, I, we wanted to kind of share students' perspective on how to improve 
uh, student engagement, like Sydney said, um, in our community. And, you know, I often hear the phrase that children are our future. So I think that in order to build a future that we um, are collectively proud of, we need to focus our efforts on starting with students in the now. So in our presentation, we're going to be kind of giving an intro into how we first got into politics. Um, and that's going to lead us into what student engagement looks like right now and why students may not be involved um, as they possibly can be and how we can together increase student engagement. And then at the end, we'll have room for questions if you guys have any. Okay. So okay. go back, go back. Um, so personally, I've always been very interested in politics and government, and especially over quarantine, like with the rise of Black Lives Matter protests, I saw my other peers getting involved and I felt very empowered to also like take action and taking the spawners government class was kind of like the bridge between my passions and interests for politics and government and then the class was like actually providing me with knowledge that I can use to like activate those interests and make change. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I grew up with like my parents having similar interests to me politically, but I don't think that kind of had like a political awakening, you'd say, um, until like the 2020 um, like Black Lives Matter protests and when everyone was sharing resources and awareness um, like online through social media platforms. And I think also like Sydney said, um, through Ms. Bonner's class and through other classes, I kind of learned more ways about how to interact with my community in other ways, and that kind of sparked my interest in politics, but there still is um, kind of ways that, you know, we wish to create resources to improve that more. So I want to talk about what student engagement really looks like today. Um, one, there's we obviously use social media as a big tool for us. I mean, I think if you're on social media, like on Instagram, Twitter, you can't really escape it. Like it's just always there. And I think there's a lot of shortcomings to that using social media as a tool, because I think it's very easy to like post, retweet, whatever, and not really take accountability or responsibility and actions um, when you post. So I think that although it is an effective tool, especially amongst youth, I think that like many students, there's much more potential to be like created with change. But I think it is a good tool for keeping students in like the know. And like, that's why I think a lot of students are now interested because we're all like on our phones and like we see what's happening. So I think it's like up to the students to take like a lot of responsibility in what they do. There's also other ways we're engaged like um, through clubs. I know there's, like my friend has a sexual education reform and awareness club and she recently created this um, like mass email template that we can email to the district to create a more inclusive sex ed curriculum. So we're getting involved in that, in that kind of way and like kind of hand in hand with community service projects. I know a lot of environmental clubs are doing, having opportunities where like students can go plant trees and take out toxic weeds and local lakes and stuff like that. So, you know, we're very engaged, we're very interested. And I think like, yeah, that shows. Yeah, and then also um, there's like educational programs like the one me and Malik are in, which is hosted by Chris Holden, our assembly member. Um, in our 41st district and like every Saturday of every month we get to pretty much learn about like one piece of legislation I know last week it was like transportation legislation and then next week we'll learn about something else but like we're also getting involved in that way too um, oh so, so we're going to talk about a little bit about why students might not be as involved as they could be um, so I think it's important, like Cindy said, to recognize the efforts that have already been made, like clubs or ed educational programs that promote stu student um, engagement in our community. But uh, there's also not a lot of resources to connect, especially students. I think a lot of the resources, I mean, even in my own personal experience, you know, I've, I've tried emailing and sometimes organizations don't respond back. And it's a little bit difficult to connect with resources, especially as a high school student. Um, and I think also a lot of students are discouraged and maybe overwhelmed. Maybe they have an idea 
that they really like. And I know me and Sydney, you know, we created a drive uh, to collect hy hygienic products and donating it to local women's shelters. Um, but a lot of students, you know, they have these ideas that personal interests, but they often feel under overwhelmed and the fact that they feel that they can't create that much of an impact in their community. Maybe they start small and it's possibly due to the fact that there's not that many resources out there um, that are, you know, kind of geared towards students at the moment. And I think Sydney will talk about more about how we can create more resources to um, kind of take on those students' interests and create more civic engagement starting with our community. If I can interrupt for a minute, when I first started asking, you know, these ladies what what you know what kind of experiences they had had in trying to connect, but like you know, I we know what's out there. Like we can open the career and say, here are all these different places where you could volunteer. We reach out to these places and then we just don't hear back, or unless you can commit to this much time. So you know, so these long term commitments are hard for kids. Yeah, I was surprised by that. Mm -hmm. They don't respond back to us either. Really? Well, mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah. small sets. Oh, yeah. yeah. um, and so to increase student engagement, I think it's important that we are provided resources and opportunities for direct engagement. Because, like Ms. Bonner earlier, um, earlier said, like if like someone like comes to class or stuff and is like, oh yeah, like you, you guys should go vote, and, like and like they're talking about like current like environmental topics or something like that, but not giving students that outlet to like activate that interest and provide resources and opportunities for that direct student engagement. I think students might like lose their interest or like might lose their curiosity and like they don't have that outlet, which I think is important because like we are very interested, but I think if we don't have the resource to kind of like activate that interest, then like that's why it kind of gets like lost like our work and stuff. And I mean, I think like it can even start like locally. I think it's really important to start there. And I know Malika said earlier, a lot of students are feeling discouraged and overwhelmed, but it's important to like keep students encouraged and, you know, motivate them and tell them like, you can make a change, you can make a difference. And I think that starts at the local level, which is really important. Okay. I, I, I also want to say, I mean, I do think that, um, that for all of us, especially given our current political climate, it's I, I think there are students that just run away from it because the, the national political scene is ugly, but the local political scene is, is fascinating, right? And for, for years, we had this community experience project where students would go to city council, they'd go to school boards, they'd go to commission meetings, and they'd come back and reflect on it. But we haven't picked it up again since COVID because most of those meetings are on Zoom. And... Maybe this is why you're here. It's not the same to have. To, I mean, if you could be folding laundry and doing twelve other things on Zoom, you just don't feel the passion that's in the room. So, um, so we're we're looking for the next thing step because I don't think Zoom's going away or hybrid. All right, so let's do, let's hear from Meryl and then we'll just make it a conversation if that's okay with you. So thank you. <laughs> Because um, because well, Carolee cannot make it today, um, but uh, Meryl is part of the um, Democratic Club, and uh, the Young Democrats are a nice model for um, uh, encouraging student engagement. Um, and so we can talk about. That. Okay, I want I want to be clear that I'm only here replacing one of the great women. <laughs> she knows more than I do, and anything. So. I will try to my best. She does have family, there's family health problems, so she couldn't make it. So I'm going to try to fill in. Uh, the Democratic Club at the high school has been there quite a long while. As I understand it, once upon a time, Carol, when Carolee's grandkids were in Claremont High, Somebody came to her, one of them came to her and said, you know, the Republicans are meeting on campus. Why don't we? Oh, and that was the start of it. As far as I now, this was a bunch of years ago, and the Republican presence on campus as an organization has gone up and down, mostly down. Okay. Anyway, we've been there a long time. And over the course of the years, how things have been conducted, of course, has changed tremendously. 
So I'm not going to be able to talk about the old days. One of the things that we did learn was you've got to have, since the meetings are at noon, they've got to have students have to have lunch. <laughs> and it's important to provide them with lunch. In fact, the expense, Carolee for a long time paid for this out of her pocket. Finally, the Democratic Club picked up and started paying for it. And the club's biggest single expense was buying pizza. <laughs> Good investment. So, <laughs> Caroline, knows, Caroline knows all the ins and outs of flying the food and so forth and so on. The biggest problem is, of course, continuity. Given the structure that there's no, people can go to Beth's class every year, it's in the books. The club has no official status like that. So, every year is starting, as it were, again. Oh, and that's always a problem. It would be great if there were some institutional way of doing it, but I, nobody's ever figured that out. So we rely on constant people like Beth and so forth in order to do this. And interest of students, and it varies from year to year, time to time, and person. Anyway, that, that, that's the biggest problem, is keeping that continuity. One of the things that we learned over the years is that it's important to let the students choose the topics that they want to have discussed at the meetings, set their agenda over the course of the year and so forth. So what happens is that at the very beginning of the year, once Curly Lane and Beth managed to get everything organized, the students decide what they want to hear about that year and how they want to structure the program. Sometimes they want to do one thing one week, one month, or something different the other month. So students choose the topics. Carolee has given the resources that the Democratic Club chooses the speakers, find somebody to match that topic. I'm going to be speaking in April on the topic of religion and politics because I knew a tiny bit about it, that's all. She plugged me in there. And I've, I've talked over the years many times, I can't even remember all the topics that have come up. Yeah, nobody's ever booed me. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's the way the topics are chosen, speakers get chosen. Everything works, I mean, it's not a long time. Being a organization of Democratic Party organization, of course, we're there to present a certain point of view on whatever issue the students decide they want to hear about. Now, it's not always a, it's not always a party point of view. I mean, the speaker does their own thing, of course. But it's something that falls within the general advocacy of the Democratic Party in the country. So, We've also found that students do appreciate opportunities to do things other than just eat pizza and listen to a speech. So Carolee's always been very good about inviting the students in the club to work at the Democratic booths at various Fourth of July, Village Venture, Earth Day when there was such a thing, uh, Juneteenth, you know, over in Ganesha Park. In other words, the club has booths and engages in public projects all over. And it's very important to offer the opportunity to the students. Oh, you can participate in this too. So it's not just new meetings and speeches and talk. And so it's important to offer these outside opportunities too. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> if there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. And if not, I'll contact Carol sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the end of our part. So now what 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 can we talk about? What what do you want to know? What do you want to yes? Um the student member of the school board, the two student members from both high school, right? 
are they chosen by the student body or is that just the administration? I'm not sure. No. They're, 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 traditionally, they're elected. I taught in high school for three years. Um, they're, they were elected at, by, at, as a site council and then a representative is chosen from those three. Has it changed in the last year? Anybody know? That's how the I don't know, high school person is chosen. But I don't think that um, other students are actually aware. Like, right. do you know that? If I don't think my students are really even I'm aware that they're in on the way off the school board. Oh, so but this one senior and then the other person, I'm not sure who it is. Like, I don't remember. Some, that in the there home. There isn't a sense of representation. Or yeah. Um, no. And I don't think they. Why? Then I think they come back and report to the student body about what went on. If there, if there's there's a there there are gaps in that loop of communication of representation. Good question. <laughs> I find that highly inadequate. That yeah. should be one of the things you look at. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have representation, it better be representative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. not, right? Otherwise, it's token. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. Yeah. Beth, do you know the other school districts that have approved the state's curriculum? Um, well, I, I or in the process of looked online. Fullerton is is offering them this year. That that was the closest one. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, how much of a pushback do you think with the school boards being taken over? How much pushback? Well, the school boards are electing more this is good right, conservative right. members on their school boards. Right. How much of a pushback to civic curriculum do you think you're going to get? Or is it possible that you won't? Hmm. Or do we have to just wait it out? I don't know the answer to that, but I but I did think about how important it is to have a league not a Dem club, a Republican club involved in this, right? If, if anything, this is the perfect place to be involved. But I don't think people are opposed to civic education if they don't think there's an agenda. However, I don't know how much this is. Yeah, I don't know. It's good, good for thought, yeah. Yeah, me either. Well, I was just, I don't know, I mean, I think over to Gina said I have this idea and I was thinking about the engagement of our league membership and I was fantasizing about a mentoring program where a league member would be in communication with a high school student and they would it would be interesting to try to make connections so that we could have multi-generational interaction and some kind of a like let's say they were doing some sort of passion project or let's say somebody in the IB program or writing their extended essay on this topic of politics or something. And it would be nice to have a group of people who wanted to be mentors to young members. And I was just fantasizing about what that might look like for our league and how engaging that might seem. I have a question for the league. Do you have a person who is your civic education person or is your point person for not just Claremont High School, but the high schools in our area? Not no, no. Would that be something you'd consider? <laughs> Considering it's part of our program, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good idea. Like that's something I would be interested in, and I can like talk with like my peers and see like how they react to that. And I would say like that. Sounds I mean, what's sad is that I get to know these these students when they're seniors and they're leaving us, right? But um, but you know, well, Sarah was here a minute ago with her daughter, right? And I I do know that like Amanda has a child coming up, you have a child coming up, Rachel has a child coming up, I have a child coming up. That you know, there will be a new generation of uh, of kids coming. It's just that it takes them so long; they don't have government until senior year. Right, and so with the NYC program, there is a social science requirement, which is not government based, but there is a psychology and a sociology and a geography like option that they have to take up in their first two years. And I, I don't think it's directly related, but I do think that it builds that social science foundation for them to have vocabulary for what's to come. And if there's a structure that they know is that they're coming to, I think there's something that worked for it. I just, from what both of you said, I, to me, it was so clear that there is a lot of passion and a lot of desire there, but it needs to be easy because you're navigating so many things in your life. And that if we could just create a clear pathway, I think we would get more local student engagement. Mm -hmm.
And as you both said, and then it can build from there. Yeah. It'd be nice to know where to connect beyond that. We actually have a comment in the chat. Um, and I just want to say apologies for any technical issues. This was a last minute switch up. Um, uh, but their comment was, um, please consider whether a student can address this immediate local need. Zoom is a remarkable opportunity for those of us with any of a variety of reasons that we can't otherwise attend in person. It is the ultimate inclusive modality, including as a vital adjunct to in-person meetings. But this meeting, as projected, it, or has some issues, clearly. <laughs> um, can a student or group of students use their technological expertise to design format for combined in-person and projected or, and Zoom meetings um, for projected PowerPoint slides for those of us online? Thank you for this outstanding topic. I hope there will be more interweaving of the community and students in action for our shared local concerns. Um, I would say, and I hope obviously address that if you would like, but um, in general, I think it's totally appropriate for adults to also have to just adapt to these changes and learn these things themselves. <laughs> um, but I don't know if you feel any, um, like there's a way that you're able to assist with some of these like technological needs. I mean, there is often a gap in ages between this kind of tech knowledge. I don't know. And how do you guys feel about Zoom coming from a time when you spent so much time <laughs> on Zoom? Do you feel similarly like it's a very inclusive model or was it effective or not effective as you guys were using it for so long? I think there's a lot of students that maybe you know open to the idea of possibly getting resources for Zoom or connecting with others through the platforms. But I think that especially I think even now a lot of students and I'm sure most people in general kind of um, would probably rather get resources in person that they can communicate with a person face to face and kind of see that. But of, of course, it's obviously there should be you know other platforms if you know if there are available in person, possibly online where students can connect with others. Yeah. Um, resource from. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Keep no. Um, <laughs> If there was interest, or maybe there just isn't, but if you're a Republican and a few other Republicans, do you think there's a feeling that your um, ideas at the high school are so out of whack with everyone else that you couldn't form your own club? Do you, um, do you have any feel for that? Like, if one were to be Republican, like, would they feel that their, like, opinions were, like, valid to share? Is that the question? Like, they they would feel there shouldn't be a club because oh. everybody, and you know, it's not, it wouldn't be the group to be in, or um, maybe not the Democratic club isn't the group to be in either. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the no party preference club is what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not sure, because, like, I know that, like, people who are um, Republican at the school feel pretty passionate about their ideas as well. And like, I've never really like run into someone that felt like they couldn't share their opinion. I feel like a lot of Vermont students are pretty opinionated. And like, I know like, <laughs> yeah. um, I know like the Republican club, like there was a Republican club there and like, even in like government classes. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. There was yeah. Some yeah. Uh -huh. And like they're out there during club rush, the Democratic yeah. clubs out there during club rush. And even in government class, I feel like when we had Socratic seminars and discussions, like it, I think it was like clear what everyone's opinions are and views. And I don't think anyone necessarily like felt afraid to share. Yeah, that's great. I think it's scary online for kids. I got that from some of the Republican club kids from last year who said, you know, they, 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 they call us fascists or they call yeah. us racist or they call us this. Kind of like, but in person, they treat each other. That's interesting. Why would that be? <laughs> Social media. Mm -hmm. yeah, so behind yeah. a screen, it's much easier to be able I mean, to. I think our culture has, has it's easy. That's what our culture does. We fight instead of connect. And so that is the cultural norm among adults. I don't know why we would expect difference from teenagers. Our, the adult behavior that's, that's projected in social media and in news platforms is. It's not argumentative in the old, like, Socratic way. It's argumentative in, I have an opinion, and I'm unwilling to know what you think. I'm unwilling to ask what you think. 
And so I feel like it's hard to be a bipartisan teenager or a teenager who maybe isn't, I'm not saying that you can't be passionate about this political party and this political party, but discourse, we don't teach discourse. We don't know how to have that and we don't see it modeled in our culture. I think that would be something the league can help model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think like a lot of students find it difficult to like talk like, do you belong to that? And I think it's a problem on both sides. And it's like, okay, like if you belong to that party, if you belong to this party, then I'm like unwilling to talk. And I think I agree, like that's a really like major problem. And especially in classrooms, I can see that being a big problem because if we can't have that conversation, then we're never gonna be able to like bridge our differences and find like something we can agree on. And I I do find that like issue in classrooms. So I think it's also important for like teachers to like lay that foundation to for students to be able to like talk. Mm -hmm. And I also so, think like, sorry, yeah. Um, I also think like even in Ms. Bonner's class, like I felt like that was a lot of people's first time kind of seeing a, the way to interact with each other and each other's opinions in a respectful manner and kind of looking at the other point through a educational perspective rather than just like seeing stereotypes or whatnot. And so I think that, and that's obviously like government education is in your 12th grade year. So a lot of students in, you know, whether freshman, sophomore, junior year, or even seniors too as well, they often don't have the background of how to properly discuss with each other in like a respectful manner with while like seeing like different opinions and why that is. And uh, yeah, so I think that maybe teachers like Sydney said, like teachers implementing ways um, or educational like, opportunities of discussion in a respectful manner and teaching how to do that. Do you think that should happen at a younger age so that by yeah. the time you get so maybe middle school, so start in sixth grade learning how to yeah. talk to each other yeah. so exactly. that by the time you are getting to into really pertinent day-to-day -day life changing issues, which you will now be doing after you go to college, especially that if they've learned to talk to each other at younger ages, how do you think we can implement that without getting kickback from parents to the school boards or to the <laughs> teachers or to everyone else? Yeah, that's, just, uh, that's I mean, that's what I think is the biggest obstacle is every time you try to have a conversation identifying both sides of an argument, Kids go home and say, hey, mom, guess what I learned today? And mom gets on her high horse and runs down to the school. Nice. And then it stops. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a really good question. It's like, I was just going to say that, like, even though I do see it as a problem, like, I, I find it within myself, too. Like, if I see it, if I, like, see someone from, like, a different party, then, like, I also, like, can recognize how I might be, like, um, judgmental and unwilling to talk. So, like, I wish I also learned it, too um when I was younger and I think that it should be implemented in like even elementary and middle school but I don't think it has to be kids on um, the playground yeah yeah and I think it's also like a conversational skill too like it's not really a political one either it's more just like how can we talk about our differences and not have it be something so personal like it doesn't have to be um like uh have like a political like stance to it when we teach it I think it can just be like um, like how can we have a conversation with each other as like a social skill as well. I, I feel like it, it in many places, the way they're teaching writing, the way you're teaching discourse now is done where it's like, okay, we need to have a claim, but we need to understand the counterclaim. We need to have evidence. But, um, but it is the transfer over to politics that we don't quite do until your senior year. And I think it's, we're all a little afraid of it. It's scary, and it's scary maybe because you're you're afraid of pushback, um, and there's no way. I mean, I always say to students, "Okay, here's who I am. Look for my bias." But like, I'm not going to pretend I'm neutral because there's no such thing, right? But mm -hmm. we can try to be balanced, right? So, but you're right. It is almost, and I think that what happens is brave students put themselves out there, and then students who haven't had this kind of experience or heard it in a positive way withdraw. But that's the piece, right? So so how do we get people not to withdraw? Yeah. I just want to add, there's a lot of students who don't know where they stand. Which and is right that makes yeah. it, and so making a safe environment, and I know my colleagues yeah, want to yeah. see here, I mean, we all try in our own way, even, even as a math teacher, right? I, um, we could 
Mm. And, and, but we need to make sure that, and I'm preaching to the choir here, that the people who don't know where they are, I mean, I certainly have had students come up and say, well, I know what my parents think, but you mentioned this and, you know, but it was, it was mostly personal. I mean, in that classroom discussion, someone has a hard time when they don't know what claim they want to make, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they are, and so um, I think that um, to, the little bit I know about the league, since I'm like now 48 hours into being a, having paid my dues. <laughs> uh, being, you know, nonpartisan, and it's not two sides of an issue. I mean, there are always many sides of an issue. And um, modeling that, I think, um, I know sometimes there's been, you know, candidates for some of our non partisan offices like the um, city council and having another school board election <laughs> uh, coming up that uh, I think modeling that's really important. I uh, got the feeling that a lot of this discussion was happening in TOK, Theory of Knowledge, about 10 years ago now. And um, my daughter didn't call it the Democrats and Republicans, it was more the liberals and the conservatives. I don't even think she used the word conservative, but that's where I felt there was a lot of discussion, but it was very clear there were Zoas on that side and she and her friends were on this side. And, and then it became our dinner conversation. Like, what happened today in TOK? Um, <laughs> that's a very so, small group of students. I'm sorry? It's a small group of students. Yeah, very experienced, very small. But you were talking your class. I think for her, it really came up more in um, TOK. Yeah, right. I also wanted to say adults are discouraged and overwhelmed right now, <laughs> not only students, you know, and we thank God, what can we do, you know, in all this group, ha ha. But, uh, yeah. We have another chat question. Um, is it possible to add an elective available before senior year for civic engagement, including communication skills for our diverse democracy? Uh, I, I think I could answer that, no. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I do think that we could, I, I mean, in a practical way, um, right? It needs to be a course that's UC approved. It needs to have, be within the school budget and we're bringing in MYP. There's all kinds, yeah, well, it's complicated. However, that doesn't mean this piece doesn't have to get stronger within the social science and the English and your, I mean, yeah, they, these are skills that don't have to be taught separately though. It'd be great to have a class like that. I think there are two really uh, immediate ways that we can implement. You just mentioned MYP. The curriculum for MYP is currently being built. And if we look at our colleagues who are teaching seventh through 10th grade to build units into their existing courses or to build habits of communication into their existing courses, this is a vibrant time to help that happen for the younger students. I think the second thing that's already possible is we have implemented a homeroom situation at our school. And homeroom, all students are engaged in homeroom once a week for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I forget, it's changed. But um, <laughs> this would be also a time to have um, intentional civic discourse opportunities. It would just be about building the curriculum for that. But both of these are new programs that are open to building curriculum right now. And this would be a time for us to make suggestions to the, the curriculum builders for that, of which I want. So <laughs> to my community, I think it's really important. So it's not about having a course that you would have to sign up for, but embedding it into courses um, that all students have access to. So there would be, um, it, it would be open to, to all. It would not be something that only the academically advanced get or something along those lines. Okay. MYP stands for Middle Years Program. Thank you. <laughs> and it, um, it's under the International Baccalaureate as well as for the middle years. So seventh through 10th grade, they have a primary year course for the younger, younger, and then they have the diploma program for the 11th and 12th graders. So it's brand new coming in. We're piloting it right now and coming in the certification for seventh through tenth grade right now um, over the three to five year process. So it's an exciting time to make curriculum and make um, instructional choices 
that would be open to all students. Like, like I think I think I heard the number that 75% of incoming 10th graders have signed up. They've opted into the middle year program. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. And so what I see from those numbers is that it looks like it's even continuing. It will continue to grow over time. I, I, I want to bring something up to that you say, which is it's always an issue for all of us at the high school is how do you make this not just a program for the kids who will choose to opt in mm -hmm. because already a lot of those students are having the kind of dinner table conversations you had with your own kids, which means they're they're already on their way there. Um, and so, um, you know, so we have district initiatives that happen from the school board. And as you say, if we were to emphasize um, habits of communication, whether this is civic education specifically, or, you know, talking again, um, <laughs> uh, that would be a nice thing to push for. So, um, another chat question. Um, what is taught in US and world history that can add student skills and understanding? Another factor before high school, when I last knew about it 10 years back, US history doesn't go past the Civil War progressive era at best. That's, um, that's eighth grade, mm -hmm. US history. And then 11th grade, US history starts at reconstruction to present day. So the, the curriculum gets longer every minute. That's great. <laughs> it just <hits. laughs> however i mean there's all uh, you guys we all know there there's curriculum and there's implementation right and so again hmm, yeah enough said <laughs> could you just talk about i don't know who everybody here is since i've not been a very active league member for a long time and when i was really active with the league and school board it was a very long time ago what i'm concerned about the kids who are not college bound and what kind of civics education they're getting because i think that's really crucial and um it's like most of what we've been talking about sounds like it's aimed at college bound students and krista told me that college bound students have to take government in order to go to the ucs or colleges and they can get this special certificate you were talking about but kids who aren't going to college are not going to be trying to get that special certificate are they required to take government and if so what kind of government education are they getting and are they really learning how to be actively involved in the political life and this civic life of their communities these, you know, we are just, you know, this is this is quiet activism happening in this room with questions like you're all asking. Um, all students are required to take one semester of government okay. and one semester of economics, free enterprise economics, we'll say. Okay, to um, graduate, just graduate, graduate from high school. Okay. Um, I will say that there's been a big movement to make government an online asynchronous course so that students can fit other things into their schedule um and and you know it is what it is i take it over the summer to get it out of the way mm -hmm. so we again i'm not anti-zoom but we all know that there is something about being together and talking and and saying how are we applying this uh, book questions aren't doing it so Especially for the subject, <laughs> so there are structural issues that are just Krista. I mean, we're all just over here smiling. It's like, gosh, this is what we need to. I, I maybe superintendent can come to this next time because the high school's in transition well, right now. Question was for MIT, and this is probably in the weeds. Why wasn't government given as one of the options for that ninth grade year? I'm not, I'm not paying um, grade. It's not high. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I'm serious when I say that. I'm not in the pay grade that could answer that question, but I could ask that question to the people who would know, I think. Just, I mean, I'll, I'll have another discussion with you about that. that. It's not like I'm brilliant when I came up with that. 
So Jasper. But I am taking notes right now. I think there are some things that I'm wondering if the league can craft a letter that goes to the high school that, I, you know, it's one of those things where you, I always think it's important if you're going to complain about something that you have, you put in things that you're suggesting. You give valid suggestions and not expect the person that you're talking to to be able to read your mind or to figure it out. But I think um, a conversation with the people who developed the homeroom curriculum, that is equal access to all students on campus. Mm -hmm. Every student has a homeroom class. And so that wouldn't just be for honor students. And it, it it's ongoing over time. And so it might be that there is a civics component to that that gets generated. I think a letter needs to go to the, the to that body who creates that, asking them to, and maybe we can be maybe a representative committee could be part of that, suggesting what would what might that look like, um, what kind of conversational skills might go into that. Maybe a letter needs to be crafted to the English department about developing um, civic discourse unit, or or we have to teach speaking and listening in the, in the standards. The state standards require teaching speaking and listening. Is this an opportunity to teach kids about civic discourse? That the the I heard Sydney say it was the, um, something about it's not just set up these political things, but set up the social skills of having dialogue. Mm -hmm. That that's something that could go in get in place in all English classes, in open access to all levels of students, not just honor students. Um, have I? Uh, a letter to our new principal coming in next year since we're having a principalship, a letter to the principal saying, what kind of things can we put in place so that we affect school culture, the way we communicate with, with each other in, on campus and how, how might that, I think. And maybe hitching our wagon to this civil, uh, civic, civil, uh, blah, 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 civic education, because this is supposed to be accessible to all students, special ed, everything, and therefore some accountability for that strand to be taught and taught well in the social science and English and the, any other classes. But that um, I, I do think that that is something that you, you could create some accountability within curriculum. Do you even have discussions on current events in any of these classes? Oh. And anything they're talking about? So, I mean, to me, it seems like homeroom would be an easy access to say, okay, tomorrow or next week, we're going to discuss Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, the one thing, the reality of homeroom is this, and this is going to change next year. The reality of homeroom is at this time, we have students that we don't normally teach. That's going to change next year. The idea of throwing out a topic and not yet creating an environment where students who are not brave yet are going to feel comfortable would not be it. Though over time, you establish a classroom culture that you're going to be able to draw people in to be able to, you know, say that thing they say for the first time. Yes. It will be different next year, right? It will, well, I'm looking at, yeah. it will be students that yeah. we have already. Unanimously sort of. Like being in a room with people that you don't know and they don't know you does yeah. not make for good conversation and relationship building. You see them once a week for 40 minutes. It's not enough, but next year it would be different. Perhaps this would be a chance for me to say, can we all introduce ourselves? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I've done that in the beginning. Oh, I'm Carolee Marshall. I'm currently the librarian at Vista Elementary School. And Barbara Rugely, I'm retired from Citrus College, and I'm the observer director of the Swine and Pebbies Lab. This is a thank you. Thank you. I'm Patty Nichol. I teach English ninth grade and twelfth grade at Claremont High School. Jan Bush, um, resident and and. Well, member, Charlene Martin, been in league forever, <laughs> uh, but currently more busy with the United Nations Association. Oh. And so thankful to Beth Bodner for helping us have a program in high schools in Pomona and here uh, for our students to have an opportunity to write an essay and um, delve into the work of the United Nations and various global issues. So it's a little bit of a, 
uh, impetus to students to go beyond their local world and think about broad issues. Thank you, Shirley. I wish we had brought, I had brought that up. We should talk more about that to the group. I'm Terry Coolball. I'm half of the team that observes the Laverne City Council. Oh, <laughs> I'm Jerry Classic. You're a league member. Yes, I'm a <laughs> league member and retired VISTA teacher. And she is the league. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you formed all the college volunteers. At VISTA, yes. Oh, only oh, like Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Melissa Peterson. I've been pretty inactive in the league, but a member since 1974. And I used to be very, very active when I was on the school board for 10 years back in the 80s and 90s. Wow. And so I'm really interested in civic education. Um, and I just think this country is globally lacking in it. Which is why I think it's great. Um, I'm Krista Carson L. Hi, I'm a guest. Um, I taught at Claremont High School. I was a theater educator for 38 years. And I currently teach for Cal State East Bay, and I'm failing retirement. There you go. Meryl Ring. I'm a retired professor of philosophy. Mm. I've lived in Claremont for getting on to 40 years now. I'm Malia Sanuki, and I'm a senior at Claremont High School and a previous student at Arizona School of and and really into the environment, right? Is that yeah thing? Many different things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Sydney Law. I'm also a senior at Kamal High School and former student. Oh, brilliant! Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really all the right ways. <laughs> I, I think you know me, Beth Bodner. So. <laughs> You're going to Gina. Oh, hi, I'm sitting on the ground. My name is Gina. I'm a league secretary um, and employee at Sycamore. Hi, I'm Cindy Rule, a league member. And I'm happy to say that I'm a former math teacher at Claremont High. And I don't know if I'm doing retirement <laughs> right or wrong, but I know Lisa tried to get me into this group like 27 years ago. <laughs> and just never give up, right? It's not <laughs> really nice. <laughs> Not yet there. There. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I do want to say for um, for Charlene's group, they have been running this um, this essay program that has been they've been so great about saying we will come and speak in your class and they try to come up with some critical thinking question that where kids will be encouraged to learn about the UN and especially in those classes where you know uh, world history and, and US history where it, it connects with the curriculum and then um, and, and they offer a lot of support with that and they're really pushing it in the high schools in the area as well so great. thank you um, and person in chat who would like to comment. Hi, Karen. Hi. I was just going to say, I am um, Karen Rosenthal. I'm on Zoom, obviously. I've been a member since I'm doing my taxes. So I'm doing double duty. I, yes. Well, if I didn't do them, my CPA wouldn't take them beyond this week. So um, I and I have been a member since 1975. And I've been, I mean, of the league. And I spoke to the Democratic group a couple of years ago when women's health care was beginning to rise to the top of political issues. And I really enjoyed the, the, the clarity with which the kids asked questions. And I thought, boy, this, and Beth Bodner was the teacher then as usual. And I was just very pleased that we had a group of kids who were going through the high school and hopefully they've been replaced with another group who will be as interested in politics or just even in public policy. It doesn't matter what party you are in, you have to be interested in public policy. Um, so congratulations and keep doing the good work, Beth. Thank you. Karen. It's really nice, Karen. Thank you. It is and I, I know all of you who work with kids, it's such a treat 
just to to feel like okay we're gonna be okay as ugly as that world seems because they care so much but again anything we can do to provide pathways for them to make it easy to get involved so they're not you know on the phone and feeling rejected I mean these two will push through but but kids, other kids, if they have an idea, as you said up there, they have an idea because they saw something online and they're like, I want to do something. Anything we can do to make that easier for them would be important. What are you going to do next year? Do I you have a plan? Uh, I'm committed to Chapman University and I'm going to do a two plus three pharmacy program. Hey, you're the healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not committed to university yet, but um, I'm going to go into architecture. Yeah. How do we wrap this up then? I love the idea of writing a letter. Yeah, me too. Yeah, um, writing a letter. Yeah. And, and the outreach, uh, a point person that can help us oh, I wrote that tackle civics as a community globally, uh, because there are specialists like me and many others that could be brought into play for, to help kids get involved in specific activities that generate more passion and more understanding and the urge to vote. There is participation. Comes, I, I agree, it comes out of a passion. And Amanda, Alice Bruski talked about, she has some students, and I, I don't think it could happen for this year, but you know, maybe next year, one of the, the younger people who passing the baton to may want to develop a relationship with the league. And I don't know if they want to start a club or if they just an issues club. Oh, oh yeah, I'm Catholic. Yeah, Claremont High School. Yeah, they, they Claremont High School. A, I don't know if everyone knows what that's talking about, but uh, they started a League of Women Voters club at the 5C's oh. club. And I, apparently they have about 20 members, yeah. I think. Yeah. And they're really, they're really active and interested in, in podcasting, perhaps, and mentoring high school students. They're very excited about the possibilities. Mm -hmm. that and wouldn't that be neat if we had a high school club? But of course, it has to come from student interest. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's similar where you could get the resources and that can be the, a point on campus. So maybe a, a great little wrap up sentence is that student membership in leagues is free. Right. Well, <laughs> it's a done deal. <laughs> okay. Sixteen. Yeah. Yeah, and like Miss Nicole, like the letter you were talking about that we can send to the school. Were you talking about like a letter that can be, um, like given to someone that's responsible for homeroom? Because I know like a lot of students are passionate about the curriculum and homeroom. So like, if you need any help with that letter, like, and have like students like connect with it and like. Um, I can give you my email. Well, let's do a hide my name. Mrs. Bodner would also be engaged in that. And we could, what I think would be great is to propose to the League of Women Voters Board a list of recommendations that are based on our position. And education is one of our topics this year. And um, if we can draft a, a list, if we can brainstorm a list of recommendations that is student informed mm -hmm. and student driven, I think that would be very powerful. Yeah, and like, I know my friend did this, I think like maybe junior year, but she wanted to change how like in middle school that they like would weigh us because she thought that was like, like something that would make kids very uncomfortable. And she was really passionate about that. And I know she present, presented it like in person just like the school board so I think that would be like pretty powerful too mm -hmm. to be able to have oh. students present in person that. oh, Ooh, that's great yeah I need a school board you don't know how excited we are to hear from you young people because it really is your world and we've left you with what you got <laughs> and we apologize we took our eye off the ball but uh yeah, we're happy you're still focused. Thank you all. Thank you. So